Hello, welcome to the paper on globalization, development and society. And the module that we are going to be discussing today is globalization, inequality and exclusion with specific reference to caste. Caste, no doubt, is a very much a phenomenon of the Indian subcontinent and more so to India. But before we talk about caste, let's reflect on what do we understand by globalization. Life in a globalized world is a matter of concern in any discourse on science, technology, industry, as well as in social sciences. The countries and the people are pushed into the trajectories of the impact of globalization in intensive and extensive manner. The new globalization strategy operating through multinational corporations has been offered as a panacea for underdevelopment and a recipe for the development of the third world countries of Asia, Africa and Latin America. And the cumulative measures of growth have come to be popularly known as the LPG model, liberalization, privatization and globalization. But the concern for a sociologist is with the impact of globalization on the different strata of society, namely classes, caste and status group. Globalization has largely affected the third world country and it has also made state weak for implementing social justice principles. In globalization, the gap between the rich and the poor has widened and it has perpetuated the inequality and unevenness in society. Das Gupta and Kylie have argued that globalization operates in an unequal and uneven manner, which is intensified by the neoliberal capitalism, which further compounds the disparities in society, resulting in the process of social exclusion. The concept of social exclusion came from social welfare policy of the French government and was used for the first time by René Lenoir. The notion has, however, already made substantial inroads into the discussion and writing on poverty and deprivation. There is a large and a rapidly growing literature on the subject. Amartya Sen further used this concept in his analysis of poverty and capability deprivation. Some of the European government, including the UK, have established separate ministries to deal with issues of social exclusion. The World Bank in its World Development Report of 2006 and the UNDP Development Report of 2005 selected a similar theme of inclusion to influence strongly the way to understand, design and implement development policies. The Planning Commission of India has also deliberately chosen the strategy of inclusive growth in 12th five-year plan to bring the socially excluded groups into development process. Thus, the notion of inclusiveness has entered the public discourse through these reports and initiatives. The concept of a social exclusion is employed in understanding a wide range of social and economic marginalities. Social exclusion can indeed arise in a variety of ways and it is important to recognize the versatility of the idea and its reach. It's, it, is essential, it essentially refers to the process through which groups are wholly or partially excluded on the basis of group identity from full participation in the economy and society in which they live. Multiplicity of deprivation and structurally organized unequal social relations are two defining characteristics of exclusion. It is embedded in the societal relation epitomized in corresponding societal institution. The process through which individuals or groups are wholly or partially excluded from full participation in the society in which they live. Thorat also presents similar features of social exclusion saying that it involves two crucial dimensions, namely the societal interrelations causing exclusion and their outcome, which cause deprivation. Myra Buvenik summarizes the meaning of social exclusion as the inability of an individual to participate in basic political, economic and social functioning of the society and goes on to add that social exclusion is the denial of the equal access to opportunities imposed by certain groups of society upon others. The definition captures the three most distinguishing features of social exclusion, namely that it affects culturally defined groups. Number one. Number two, that it is embedded in social interrelation, the process through which individual or groups are wholly or partially excluded from full participation in the society in which they live. And number three, that its outcome is deprivation, low income and high degree of poverty of the excluded group. It recognizes the diverse way in which social exclusion can cause deprivation and poverty, 
Consequences of exclusion thus depend crucially on the functioning of social institutions and the degree to which they are exclusionary and discriminatory in their consequences. Social exclusion has a sizable impact on an individual access to equal opportunity if social interactions occur between group in subordinate relationship. Amartya Sen draws attention to various meanings and dimensions of the concept of social exclusion. Distinctions are drawn between the situation where some people are kept out, at least left out, and where some people are being included, may even be forced to be included in deeply unfavorable terms and describe the two situations as unfavorable exclusion and unfavorable inclusion. The unfavorable inclusion with unequal treatment may carry the same adverse effect as unfavorable exclusion. Sen also differentiated between active and passive exclusion. For the casual analysis and policy response, Sen argued that it is important to distinguish between active exclusion, which is fostering of exclusion through the deliberate policy interventions by the government or by any other willful agent to exclude some people from some opportunity, and passive exclusion, which works through the social process in which there are no deliberate attempts to exclude but nevertheless may result in exclusion from a set of circumstances. Sen further distinguishes the constitutive relevance of exclusion from that of instrumental importance. In the former, exclusion or deprivation have an intrinsic importance of their own. For instance, not being able to relate to others and to take part in the life of the community can directly impoverish a person's life in addition to the further deprivation it may generate. This is differently from social exclusion of instrumental importance in which the exclusion itself is not impo impoverishing but can lead to the impoverishment of human life. Consequences of exclusion thus depend crucially on the functioning of the social institution through network of social relation and the degree to which they are exclusionary and discriminatory in their outcome. The group focus approach recognizes that people are excluded because of ascribed rather than achieved features beyond individual agency or responsibility. In India, exclusion revolves around the societal institution that exclude, discriminate and isolate and deprive some groups on the basis of group identity like caste, ethnicity, religion, gender and others. Group exclusion is based on social and cultural identity of persons irrespective of the attributes of individual. Over the last few years, there has been a significant shift in social policy discourse from a focus on tackling social exclusion towards one of promoting inclusion. Such a change in the focus inevitably has consequences for how we understand, frame and potentially address the way in which certain individuals and groups are marginalized and excluded. The way in which the socially excluded are constructed within policy and practice discourse can result in a number of potential consequences. In particular, it can lead to a focus on changing the individual's choices and aspirations rather than the social context which constrain their choices. In this way, the problem which needs to be addressed is not social inequality, oppression or discrimination, but cultures of low aspiration and fatalism. The notion of social exclusion as a dynamic term focusing attention on the power dynamics is involved in social practices of exclusion and marginalization. Thus, exclusion has been turned from a process with identifiable cause into an outcome, a condition people are in. As such, several ambiguities in the social exclusion literature in both social policy and development study fuel the common criticism that the concept is redundant with respect to already existing approaches, particularly more multidimensional and processual approaches. In order to resolve these ambiguities and to derive value added from the concept, social exclusion needs to be reconceptualized in a way that decisively opts for a processual definition. Accordingly, a working definition of social exclusion is proposed as a structural, institutional or agentive process of repulsion or obstruction. 
This definition gives attention to processes occurring vertically throughout social hierarchies and opens up applications of social exclusion approach to analysis of stratification, segregation, and subordination in development studies, especially within context of high or rising inequality. The first part of the definition is drawn from the suggestion by Gore and Figuera Dio that structure institution and agency allows for consideration of exclusion that are non-intentional as well as intentional. Indeed, structural process that repel or obstruct people or groups from certain section of a society or economy are usually not directly intentional. Social inclusion is something more than simply the converse of social exclusion. They are almost inextricably intertwined. It is in other words increasingly widespread exclusion and the social and economic costs associated with this problem that has catalyzed government concern with inclusion. In a variety of ways, the concept is tied to difference and what we do or do not do about it. Notions of social inclusion and exclusion forces focuses centrally on differences in character, individual, cultural, geographic, scribe, and achieved, and differences in opportunity to be and to do, as dictated by the background, environment, and poverty, but also by agency. Therefore, exclusion occurs when some groups of people for reasons of color, caste, ethnic identity, religious beliefs are systematically denied access to opportunities and resources which are necessary for their survival and sustenance. Social inclusion by contrast is participatory and empowering, requiring various kind of affirmative measures designed to remove discrimination, marginalization and deprivation. The possibility of inclusion through state intervention can be conceived only by knowing the structures of exclusion. Within an Indian context, exclusion is witnessed in various forms and it is much interrelated. It revolves around the societal intervention and institution that exclude, discriminate, isolate and deprive some groups on the basis of group identities like caste, language and ethnicity. Let's now come and to understand the meaning and nature of caste. Caste is a term derived from Portuguese words casta, meaning breed, lineage, or a race. It is a term used to identify the different social segment within the caste-based Hindu society. Each caste has its own custom, ritual, family, deities, and food habit. According to Baba Sahib Ambedkar, it is mainly the custom of endogamy that has preserved the caste and prevented one caste from fusing into another. Almost all the writers and scholars confirm to this view of Dr. Ambedkar. G.S. Kuriya holds that caste in India is a Brahmanic child and that endogamy, the outstanding feature of caste, was first developed by the Brahmins. The function of the caste can be understood only with regard to the caste system. The caste system is the foundation on which Hindu society is built. Dr. Ambedkar says, by the Hindu social system, the community are placed in an ascending scale of reverence and a descending scale of contempt. The Hindu caste system is a pyramid-like social structure in which majority of the lowest caste are forcibly kept at the bottom of the pyramid, condemned to manual profession and forced to serve the caste above them. Above them. Historically, the caste system has formed the economic framework for the material life of people in India. In its essential form, the caste system is based on certain unique customary rules and norms that structure production, organization, and distribution. It is the characteristics of fixed and compulsory occupation with concomitant fixed socio-economic rights. Or each caste implies exclusion of one caste from undertaking the occupation of other castes. Consequently, although every caste excepting those at the top of the caste hierarchy suffers in differing magnitude, the ex-untouchable who are located at the bottom of the caste hierarchy suffer the most as they are excluded from access to any socio-economic rights and freedom. Michael D. Barker has concluded the nature of caste exquisitely by giving the horizontal and vertical characterization of caste on the basis of the contemporary and traditional mooding on caste as given by the French scholar Louis Dumont and the famous Indian sociologist Professor Dipankar Gupta. He believes that caste equilibrium is thus sustained by the loyalty of individuals 
to their own caste above all others rather than through a fixed hierarchical power structure. The vertical perspective presumes a strict hierarchy with top-down enforcement such as that found in a racially segregated society. While Dumo promoted the traditional position of Brahminical hierarchy, Gupta and Sahai exaggeratingly emphasized upon multiple hierarchies in multiple castes. Various caste study, for example done by Jodhka in 1998, caught in 2004 on the vertical mobility of the caste status shows dire need to locate multi-dimensionality rather than single ideology of pan-Indian caste reality. <clears throat> Professor Dipankar Gupta identifies caste system as a form of differentiation wherein the constituent unit of the system justify endogamy on the basis of putative biological differences which are semaphored by the ritualization of multiple social practices. Vertical theories of caste include the race-based theory of N. Chakrabarti or the purity-based theory of Louis de Maud. Gupta says that there are probably as many hierarchies in practice as there are caste and in fact assertive caste identity articulate alternative hierarchies. Sahai believes that each caste has a notion of caste hierarchy which is constantly contested by the other castes. Though politically Indian democracy proclaims the modern and the representative spirit, yet it is undeniable to accept the persistent and perpetuation of caste in social practice and discourse. Jati still has an immense impact on social life and interaction. Hierarchies have waned unevenly, but the institution of Jati till date remains potent. No doubt, caste has emerged as a question of identity and assertion, but the persistence of hierarchy cannot be denied. As critiquing Manor, Harris argues that perhaps Manor underestimates the importance of the persistence of hierarchical values associated with caste as a factor in the way in which government works and its role in class differentiations. Caste, which as D.L. Sate puts and G.D. Berriman confirms, it constitutes a sacralized power structure which entails an ideology that explains and legitimates differences of class and power relations. Globalization as a totalistic process seems to produce two kinds of consequences. On the general feature of the economy, number one, and then second level, on the different classes, caste and ethnic group of society. It is widening and deepening some old inequalities existing in our society since many years. Example, inequality among and between status group, that is caste. Indian society with the existence and prevalence of the caste system has been facing the forces of globalization in the spirit of competition in the world market. It assumes critical significance as most of them are placed at the lowest rung of the Hindu system of social stratification. In post-independent India, the social status of the historically excluded caste, especially the scheduled caste, need to be analyzed in terms of the impact of, firstly, general structure of economic development and reservation policy, secondly, globalization and reservation policy. A major comparative study of development of Dalits against non-Dalit group has been undertaken by Thorat. The period covers from 1991 to 2000-2001. This encompassed the period of a decade of globalization. As he stated, there is a tangible improvement in the overall conditions of the scheduled caste. Their capital assets like land have improved marginally thanks to the stubborn reluctance of the political class that has enacted many paper legislation on land reform, but actually not, not much is happening on the ground level. Very few scheduled castes are in business and as entrepreneurs, they are not visible on the economic front. In regard to access to social services like housing, health, electricity and drinking water, the Dalits have experienced some change. Thorat, in a comparative study of socioeconomic change among the SCs and the non-SCs, observed that though poverty declined to 36% in 1999-2000, yet 61% of agricultural laborers were Dalit. Their access to literacy, education and health has increased, but the rural scenario has depressing both during the plan and the liberalization epoch. As the data shows, globalization and liberalization had an adverse impact on Dalits. In 2011, 56% of Dalit have been reported to be living below the poverty line. In spite of the reservation, 
in public sector jobs. They are under representations in upper echelons of the job hierarchy and show over representation in the lowest rung of the jobs. This shows the concern and commitment of the political class in regard to implementation of the policy. In the respect of health indicators, the position of Dalit is unenviable. About 56% Dalit children suffer from malnutrition and are vulnerable to all kinds of disease. In terms of access to social amenities, the Dalits are severely deprived as only 6.6% .6 of Dalits have access to housing, drinking water and electricity. Since globalization, the structural adjustment made in the economy have accentuated inequalities between different sectors of the economy and also across different social formation, example, caste and ethnic groups. The IT and manufacturing sectors have grown faster than agriculture. Information and communication technology, in fact, has created digital divide on the basis of caste significantly, both in terms of excess and equality. Despite Article 17, the Protection of Civil Rights Act 1955 and Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocity Act of 1989, untouchability is unfortunately practiced in many parts of India. It is very sad in a globalized world in a modern democratic state that the sin still exists and it needs to be condemned. Violence against Dalit is perpetuated in daylight, killing their men, raping their women and exploiting their children. In rural India, social exclusion, denial and deprivation of their needs, right and above all, the human feeling of self-respect and dignity makes the Indian society not only unequal, repressive, but also unjust, even in the globalized scenario. The slogan of inclusive growth of the policy planner on one side and the practice of caste-based social exclusion, either by design or by habit on the other, are not compatible. In fact, they have an antagonistic relation and can cause tension and conflict. Caste endogamy is regarded as one of the major citadels on which the caste system rests. Guria observation regarding inter-caste marriage remains a valid one. Caste endogamy remains the social desideratum and conversely, inter-caste marriage between scheduled caste and higher caste is said to bring shame upon the family of the latter. Given the importance of face and honor in Indian society, it is likely that inter-caste marriage may jeopardize the self-esteem of higher caste to perceive inter-caste marriage as a shameful dishonor. Since this may impede the development and maintenance of positive self-conception. Judge and Bal assert that casteism is embedded in the mind and the worldview of the people and may persist longer than the changes in the caste system. This is coterminous with theorizing within the field of identity and social, represent and social representations, which suggest that pervasively shared hegemonic social representation rarely provide individuals with scope for reconstrual and contestation, resulting in the uncritical acceptance and reproduction of these representations. Caste hierarchies have not waned with due course in time. It continues to create inequality and perpetuate exclusion in all walks of life, even in the scenario of globalization. Various socio-economic and political studies show the evidence of such reality. The continuity and persistence has been highlighted through economic deprivation and cultural deficit. The Dalits still live in single caste locality in the villages as well as in city. Still, most of them are engaged in the traditional or low status occupation, though these occupations are no more as polluting as they were earlier. There is an articulation of caste identity which has contributed to the political and social construction of exclusion. Most of them think caste endogamy is the best option and inter-caste marriage may create problem. There is also emergence of political and cultural assertions among them. In fact, the celebration of Dalithood is somehow preventing them to break their own caste barriers. The dialectics of change among the Dalit points towards contrary trends to the modernist discourse of equality. It defies all notions of change from tradition to modernity. However, caste is showing no signs of disappearance. The emphasis has shifted from the end of the caste to the irrelevance of caste. Social inclusion is a means to achieve social justice for the excluded and deprived sections of the society. By building supportive relationship with others, it will increase opportunities for all. Social inclusion is an individual experience related to an individual's social participation, access to dignified living and an enduring sense of well-being. 
but this individual experience is directly located within the structural frames of social living what as a shorthand be called the caste system social identities inherited at birth are the real seat of discrimination and exclusion the structural and cultural deprivation largely play the role of excluding forces in the process of social inclusion of the historically marginalized such deprivations cannot be eradicated only with economic empowerment but it need to be managed with a comprehensive and context specific approach for social inclusion the concept of social inclusion has varied connotations in different socio cultural and economic contexts this makes it defining it difficult also it is both a process and an outcome which affects how it is measured and achieved in the end i would like to say that social inclusion is a need of the r any form of exclusion based on whether perceived achieved or described status is demeaning to human race and human civilization more so in a democratic growing robust country like india thank you